purpose of the Flick Reedy Education Enterprises is to promote individual moral responsibility through education. How do we do this? We study and discuss the interrelationships of history, philosophy, social studies, and economics. We do not dictate. We do not make statements as to what we think you should or should not do. We do not unduly burden this program with footnotes, references, or complete documentation. However, we do give sufficient data to bring this discussion into proper focus. We invite you to delve further into the necessary historical and statistical data to develop a deeper understanding of truth and a keener sense of individual moral responsibility. Socialists claim that socialism offers the cure-all for the economic ills of all nations. This is the promise of socialism, just as it is the promise of communism. But the promise seems to be out of the mouths of false prophets, for the promise has failed. It's been an empty mockery. Since almost the beginning of our country, we have used the capitalistic economic system, which is really an economic system of freedom. In essence, man is free to produce and create whatever he thinks best, and free to exchange with other men according to their mutual agreements. History and our own knowledge and experience reveal what this has achieved for our country. Let's take a look at the Europe of about a decade ago so we can make some comparisons. An investigating team from one of our Midwest colleges made a trip to Europe to study socialism as it existed there. Before departure, they had prepared as objective a method as they could for taking the measurement. They would concentrate heavily on the people living under the various conditions of socialism and their reaction to it. Among the many other factors that were measured and recorded, they attempted to establish two factors. First, a reasonable approximation of the percentage of socialism which existed in the countries at the time, and an average monthly wage in those countries. The countries visited were Norway, Sweden, France, Belgium, Netherlands, England, West Germany, Austria, Yugoslavia, and Italy. The first chart indicates the percentage of socialism in the way of life of a given country as the research team measured it. The countries have been arranged so that the country with the largest percent of socialism is on the left, and so on with lesser percents of socialism to the right, and then including our United States for purposes of comparison. In the second chart are shown the average monthly wages for these same countries, and our United States for purposes of comparison. The arrangement of the countries is the same as on the first chart, with Yugoslavia on the left, the United States on the right. The average monthly wage figures are for gross monthly income before taxes and converted to American dollar values by the official rates of exchange. Now let us put the two charts together. What conclusions may be drawn? This chart indicates that the higher the percentage of socialism, the lower the average monthly wage. In other words, socialism is not prosperity for all. In fact, the worker is much poorer under the socialistic system. The coal industry and the export of coal had long been one of the mainstays of England's commerce. Let's see how the coal industry was affected by socialism in England. George Winder, British author and lecturer in his 1960 book, The End of Dogma, had this to say. Coal has always been looked upon as the very foundation of Britain's greatness. Since early in the 19th century, its production has always been vital to her prosperity. So vital indeed that the national coal industry must be judged almost exclusively on its production. Before the First World War, Great Britain's annual output was over 260 million tonnes a year. In 1913, it reached 280 million tonnes. In the last three years before World War II, it averaged 333 million tonnes. Since then, under government ownership, its highest production has been 212 million tonnes. Furthermore, the quality of this coal has not been as high as formerly, and buyers have had little choice of different qualities. The famous Aniron Bevin was equally certain of the future of nationalization. He announced, This island is almost made of coal. Only an organized genius could create a shortage. So certain were the socialists of the success of nationalization that they actually committed Great Britain by solemn treaty with America to export in 1950 under the terms of martial aid, 30 million tons of deep mined coal to Europe. In actual fact, only a small fraction of these 30 million tons were ever sent, and the nationalized mines have never caught up to even the less efficient period of private enterprise between the two world wars. One consequence of this failure 
was that for the first ten years after the war, British industry was constantly short of coal, which had to be strictly rationed. Another consequence was that Great Britain's former export trade in coal virtually disappeared. Under free enterprise, this export had reached almost 100 million tonnes a year. In 1929, the best year between the wars, it was 60 million tonnes. In 1938, it was 35 million tonnes. The best year since the takeover has been 14 million tonnes. But that is not the whole story. Great Britain has actually become an importer of coal. You have heard the expression carrying coals to Newcastle, an expression to denote utter uselessness. Well, ships have taken coals to Newcastle since the nationalisation of the British mines, and they have had to land it with the assistance of barges, because the derricks on the wharves were made only to handle coal outwards, not inwards. Probably nothing epitomises the failure of the British nationalised coal industry so much as these coals to Newcastle. The socialists claimed that government ownership of industry would bring greater prosperity, that if the government would take over the railroads, the banks, there would be greater productivity, and all its people would enjoy a higher standard of living. Now, of course, to achieve this, there had to be central planning by a government board with absolute power. While England tried very hard to prevent assigning people to jobs, whether they wanted that job or not, and then freezing them there, we heard earlier that they found it to be necessary in order to carry out the central planning by the socialist leaders. Government control of jobs, prices, wages, and a whole host of other things were absolutely necessary. For once a government tries to plan almost all things for all people, it must also have almost total control of all people. The history of modern socialism has been traced from its source, the Communist Manifesto, and then its appearance in peculiar forms in such countries as Italy, Germany, England, and the United States. Perhaps you've already made up your mind about your attitude toward socialism. Perhaps you want to do some reading on the subject. You should be extremely careful about accepting alleged facts from anyone, including me. You owe it to yourself and your family to double-check the alleged facts from whatever source. No matter what your conclusions might be, they should take some form of meaningful expression. You should translate your convictions into votes and guidance for those people who represent you in your governments at all levels, local, state, and national. Everyone's time is limited these days. It's a time-consuming task to find out the kind of ideas and philosophies of various candidates for office. There is some help available in finding out the nature of the ideas and philosophy of at least your representatives at the national level, providing they have been in office for a full term. Campaign speeches are doubtful sources of specific information. The real concern of political candidates is to avoid saying something during a campaign which will lose votes, so they tend to play safe and say things which really won't get anybody mad at them. Only rarely do they take sharp, clear stands on political issues. There's a saying which is quite reliable, and that is, By their voting record shall you know them. But, you say, I don't have time to read all the bills that my senators and representatives vote on. And I'm not even sure how they voted on most of the bills, unless the newspaper happened to mention it. There are quite a few reliable organizations who do take the time and trouble to analyze the significant votes of your senators and representatives. These organizations usually select from the thousands of legislative bills anywhere from 15 to 50 key bills which reflect the ideas and philosophy of the legislator. Each of these organizations has a political philosophy of its own, which they make known to anyone who's interested. The American Farm Bureau Federation and the National Farmers Union have a primary interest in farm legislation. The AFL-CIO's Committee on Political Education, called COPE, is primarily interested in how the legislators vote on bills pertaining to unions and organized labor. We shall review in a bit more detail the Americans for Democratic Action and the Americans for Constitutional Action, known as the ADA and the ACA. There's substantial evidence to show that these five organizations do an accurate job of determining how closely the various legislators follow the organization's philosophies. The Americans for Democratic Action has been in existence for some time. Because its name includes the word democratic, doesn't mean that they like or endorse all or only candidates of the Democratic Party. They are an independent organization, as are all those that have been mentioned. Here are some quotations relating what the ADA has said about itself. Karl Auerbach, writing in the ADA World in April of 1958, said, ADA was founded in 1947 to fill the compelling need for a liberal movement, which would bring the labor movement, and hopefully some farm organizations, 
into continuing alliance with liberal politicians and intellectuals to clarify the aims of the New Deal and work for their achievement. The next statement is by Joseph L. Rao, Jr. It appeared in the same issue of the ADA World. From the start, we have debated the question whether ADA should be a Fabian society or a political organization or maybe even just a liberal pressure group. Throughout, my position has always been that ADA must have the potential of all of these. It is the ability to be flexible. That is basic to ADA's ability to infuse liberal ideas into the body politic. And further, from the ADA world of September 1960, the voting record is offered as a guide for liberals in judging the performance of their senators and congressmen on issues of importance. And finally, from a statement of political declaration, 1960 National Convention Socialist Party says, The Socialist Party is wholeheartedly dedicated to the fight for realignment. In that fight, we are not alone. The United Automobile Workers, AFL-CIO, Americans for Democratic Action, New York's Liberal Party, and other outstanding progressive movements are on record for realignment. Do you have an idea of the general philosophy of the ADA and what its hopes and aims are? They make their voting index to indicate how legislators stand on the ADA philosophy. A high percent number means the legislator voted favorably on the bills the ADA backed. The Americans for Constitutional Action is newer than the ADA, having become active about 1960 or shortly before. Here are two statements made about it by itself. ACA believes that the Constitution is based on ethical and political principles which originally arose out of religious faith and conviction and even today rests on those sanctions. One, that each person's rights, liberties, and responsibilities are endowed by God. Two, that government's basic function is to be a servant in securing the God-given inalienable rights. Three, that the only proper powers government has are those clearly and consciously delegated to it from the ACA Index of 1960. The second statement is made by Kenneth W. N. Wilson, Executive Director of ACA. The index aims at lifting political analysis from selfish detailed issues to the high level of principles that appeal to the conservative common sense of the American people. Here again, as with ADA, the ACA has set forth its ideas and philosophy in clear, understandable style. In its index, a high percentage figure means the legislator voted the way ACA felt the Constitution indicates, a significant number of times. In the next series of picture frames, we'll see both the ADA and the ACA rating for senators, from records compiled from their voting in the 87th Congress and first session of the 88th, or roughly 1961-62 and 1963. Senators have been chosen because they're more well-known throughout the country. We'll start alphabetically with Alabama. Hill, Democrat, ACA, 11%. ADA, 80%. Sparkman, Democrat, ACA, 12%. ADA, 80%. The D behind the names of the senators indicates that they are elected Democrats. It's shown from the percent scores that Senators Hill and Sparkman's votes are more in accord with ADA philosophy than with ACA. A similar tabulation is prepared for all the members of the House of Representatives. Most of the organizations are willing to share their tabulations with any interested persons. Notice how in these four states there is little or no similarity between the ACA and ADA ratings and the political parties. Both Democrats and Republicans are rated high or low by both the ADA and the ACA. A citizen need only decide what his own philosophical ideas are then use the voting index of the organization most nearly reflecting his philosophy. Let me again establish that these raiders do an accurate job of scoring the legislators according to the ideas, goals, and hopes that that rating group has. Only when the citizen voter knows the philosophy of the candidates can he predict with reasonable certainty how they will vote on issues after they are elected. <laughs>